My today's guest is Vuk from Protocol Labs. He is originally from Serbia and he started to mine in 2013. So I was very interested to learn uh, more about that time and I got a lot of insights uh, what was mining back then in, in 2013 in Serbia, how the Serbian ecosystem uh, developed and what is uh, the focus there. I learned that currently Serbian developers are priced higher uh, than in Germany. That is an interesting situation, but that also shows how uh, if, you, if you start to support um, the, de the development, the technology, uh, it brings value to uh, the economy. And uh, we f uh, also talked about uh, the recent developments in the Filecoin uh, ecosystem that you can dedicate uh, storage without providing a lot of computing power. Um, and finally, for sure, we talked about coffee and Vuk is uh, a fan of Cold Trip as I am. And uh, we talked about that uh, a little bit as well. I hope you enjoyed today's talk. Have fun. Welcome to Coffee from the Block from the House of Blockchain in Liechtenstein. My today's guest is Vukashi Vukoye from Protocol Labs. He is the startup operator, ecosystem growth. Welcome to Coffee from the Block. Thanks. I am allowed to call you Vuk, right? Yeah, yeah. It's course. easier. Um, where are you from originally? I'm uh, originally from Belgrade, uh, Serbia. Serbia, okay. And um, it's a tough question for everybody in the Web3 space to ask them where they are domiciled, where they live. Uh, do you have a clear answer on that or is it globally? <laughs> yeah, it's mo mostly globally. Uh, yeah, fre frequently people pay, uh, ask you where you pay taxes. Uh, True, they, they don't because that's the most uh, <laughs> qu consequence you have yeah, based yeah. on your, <laughs> your domicile. <laughs> yeah, I cur currently pay taxes in Serbia, but not for, for so long. Yeah, okay, okay. But you travel a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm mostly uh, moving where web free events are, yeah. uh, but, uh, but yeah, generally global. And um, tell us a little bit more uh, what a startup operator ecosystem growth does. Yeah, so uh, at Protocol Labs, there are many roles that are not uh, that frequent uh, generally uh, because Protocol Labs needs a lot of entrepreneurial talent uh, in their organization. So uh, a startup operator in a way is an entrepreneur in residence. Uh, so you get a problem and you don't really get much guidance on how to tackle that particular problem. And then you try to figure out uh, how to actually solve the problem and you have many ways of approaching that either trying to like uh, figure out how to get resources internally in the organization or figuring out how to maybe contract someone externally to, to solve a problem or even starting a team yourself and maybe creating a company that actually tackles that but really trying to be very pragmatic on how you approach the problem and really making uh, frequent uh, progress towards a, a direction where the problem doesn't exist anymore. And those are very ambitious problems. For example, one of them could be how to make uh, onboarding to the Falcon network uh, in terms of data more efficient. Mm -hmm. And for that, there are many pieces that you need to consider, like hardware implications, like who are the different personas participating in that uh, particular activity. For example, that could be uh, the uh, storage client. So that's the person that wants to store a particular piece of data. Uh, on the other hand, you have the storage provider, which is uh, the person that needs to onboard that storage that would also require some hardware to actually uh, use for storing the data in a longer term. And then there are many other details that need to be tackled in order for that activity to, uh, to be possible. And then the role of a startup operator is to uh, first understand what the problem is, try to understand the entire environment, understand all the different personas uh, in that particular problem, and then uh, tackle it either with products or some programs that uh, might incentivize like, a particular behavior in the ecosystem. When you came to my office today or to our office today, I showed you my 22 terabyte hard drives I just got because we had to increase our storage here locally. And I asked you pretty, I'm a simple person, I just asked you, look, how can I dedicate storage to Filecoin? And you said, it's a very lawyerish answer actually. You said, yeah, that's uh, very complicated in, in a way, or it was uh, challenging, yeah. and you try to fix a solution. So that is these kinds of problems you just mentioned. There's a problem, it's not that easy, or it was not that easy to dedicate storage uh, to the Filecoin network. You identified that problem, and now you came up with a solution. In-house, or you started a startup? 
Yeah, did, uh, uh, yeah, a few things. Like, uh, uh, actually, to tackle that problem, uh, I was required to like start uh, another uh, company that is separate from Protocol Labs, but also to like uh, incentivize a separate team to work on on a second part of the problem. So, uh, let's try to understand what's happening uh, generally in the Falcon ecosystem. But first, some context. So, like, the Falcon ecosystem is very young. So, like, uh, um, it was the mainnet was uh, launched maybe two years ago at this point. So two years uh, of the start of like something that uh, will eventually be uh, like uh, huge and even now it's 18 exabytes of capacity. So that's uh, much more than uh, what AWS and Microsoft had like uh, after two years of, uh, uh, of being born. So I basically can store data there if I like what, you, because you mentioned AWS, uh, one of the biggest uh, cloud service providers, cloud data storage uh, service providers, Filecoin in simple terms is that. So if you want to talk, uh, like if you want to explain to a, yeah. to an average person, that what they can think of. Yes, yes. But Filecoin. also it's important to understand that we are just in the beginning. So like mm -hmm. uh, the technology is not mature enough where everyone can contribute to the network. And generally what we try to do is uh, uh, make it more accessible to everyone and make it possible that everyone uh, store some uh, some particular uh, data on their computer and be part of the network. But for that, we had to tackle uh, one very big problem, which it was the fact that like in order to onboard data to the Falcon network, it required a lot of computational power. So what we did is we focused on decoupling the compute intensive from the storage intensive pieces, so that uh, a person that has so hard to rise from CPU and GPU. Yes, yes. Okay. So for example, in your particular case. If you have 100 terabytes of data, uh, it would be enough for you to just put like a rack full of drives uh, in a data center or even uh, uh, keep it at home if you have a fiber optic connection and uh, you would be able to like store data for the Falcon network. And this is possible now and it was not before because it decoupled yes. the... Okay. Yes. Now the third problem, uh, which was the one that we had to create a, a separate company for, uh, is the uh, liquid staking problem. So uh, the reason for, the, uh, for uh, why the problem exists is that if you want to store data on the Falcon network, you would also need to, to lock some collateral in order to, uh, to actually have guarantees that you're going to keep storing the data for a longer period of time. So what you do is you lock a particular amount of fill, which mm -hmm. is the token behind uh, the Falcon economy, uh, and you lock it, for example, for four years. And uh, if you keep storing uh, the data for four years, you get block rewards. Now, uh, the amount of fill that you need to, to lock is uh, really non, uh, it's not easy for people to uh, get to that much liquidity if they want to have uh, just a, uh, a cluster that they keep at home. So what we do is we on one side allow people to stake their fill into our protocol and then we find uh, the storage providers uh, that are uh, eligible and uh, are reputable enough to store uh, the data and their performance enough to allow people to retrieve that data and we allow them to uh, use the liquidity in our protocol. So, so, but then you build with that startup, you build the trust uh, between the person who wants to store uh, the data from the person who has enough liquidity in fill, uh, but his fills are then at risk. So if you don't do your job properly, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, there, there There's are a risk of, yeah. of, of losing the, the, the fields. Of course, there, there are multiple pieces. One part is a, a smart contract based protocol. Uh, so those smart contracts are basically allowing uh, the transition of uh, the liquidity from uh, a person staking into our protocol to a storage provider using that as uh, liquidity for, uh, for providing the storage. Uh, but the second part is as well uh, making sure that whoever is joining the network is joining based on particular rules and that those rules are uh, the, sa the same for everyone because we still want to create a decentralized network where uh, everyone has, the, uh, has a way to uh, join uh, the network, but they would need to oblige to some rules. For example, we want uh, the data to be stored only in particular jurisdictions in uh, Europe because we want to make sure that that data is going to be available uh, to people uh, in, uh, in that jurisdiction. But we also want to make sure that if someone is in Europe, and is taking their tokens, uh, the tokens are not going to Asia or are not going to Africa and uh, some mm. countries where uh, they are possibly at risk of being lost. So 
because of or misuse, yeah. depending on if you don't set it up properly. I mean, you can encrypt the data stored on your network. Right? Yes, but uh, but then you can lose the data, which yeah. is also like a, a big problem. Mm. So we want to incentivize a particular behavior uh, for a particular set of uh, uh, storage providers that we think should be part of this early uh, storage network, and uh, we use liquidity for that. Mm. Okay, interesting. And, and Europe, for sure, with the GDPR, uh, with all of the regulation, with data privacy, and um, is it fair to say that it's somehow similar? Because Liechtenstein has a tradition of um, wealth protection, um, that uh, these digital assets are the wealth of the future, or maybe already today. Um, that to store data is to store the wealth of the future and therefore it's, uh, it makes sense to store it in reputable jurisdictions with a long tradition of, of keeping values and securing values. Yeah, yeah, that, that's also my opinion and I really believe uh, in that and uh, that's why we are so focused on Europe and the US where we have like a stable regulatory framework. Uh, but also if you think... Uh, Sure, when you're storing there, you're already storing something valuable, which is hard to uh, uh, value today. Like you can't really approximate how much a particular piece of data is valuable. Uh, but in the case of the Falcon network, it's even uh, it's even more powerful because when you're storing any particular piece of data, you're storing also liquidity. So mm -hmm. you're storing at the same time a token that mm -hmm. has a lot of value and you're storing the data. Mm -hmm. And if... Uh, someone wanted to associate that particular token with the data, that means that that data is probably valuable and that it should be stored. Mm. Uh, so then you have like a certainty that if you're storing valuable data with also collateral that is super valuable, uh, that you're really storing something useful. Mm. Interesting. And uh, so this is the role you are now playing um, at, at Protocol Labs. Before that, you were at Cardano, and before that, you had an own company or startup. Tell us a little bit more about your history. How did you find out about blockchain, or what was your first contact? Did you first find out about Bitcoin or some other coin, or, or uh, how did you end up in that space? Yeah, so I started uh, mining uh, Litecoin back in 2013. Uh, it, where, in, in Serbia? Yeah, in oh. Serbia, in Serbia. Okay. Uh, actually, I was still studying back then, so like it was basically my dorm room, uh, and uh, I remember that I couldn't sleep well because like the fans <laughs> were so so noisy, and I was hoping <laughs> that uh, Litecoin would go up so I could buy liquid uh, cooling. Uh, that <laughs> and you can sleep again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you did not lose uh, sleep because of any other impact on cryptocurrencies. You no. literally lost sleep because it <laughs> because was too of the loud. Fans, yeah. It wasn't yeah. your okay. Yeah. I uh, wish I could do that today, but uh, uh, yeah, today I'm. Uh, I had a fridge when I was studying. That. I had a fridge in my in my sleeping room, in my dorm room, and I had to get used to the sound. And it's actually interesting. After as, as uh, after a month or two, I did not hear the fridge <laughs> anymore. Yeah, yeah. But you get did used it happen to you as well? You get no, used to it. No, it was like 55 decibels. So oh, like, it <laughs> okay, and it was constant. So. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, uh, at some point, prices went up so much that uh, it made sense for me to sell the entire uh, yeah. infrastructure. So I sold all the miners because uh, uh, it was crazy. Like you couldn't buy a GPU back then in the entire country. Yeah. And even some politicians were starting to mine and like that was basically game over. So, uh, yeah, I sold all the hardware I had and uh, then started uh, a company. The company was a, a offline social network. I managed to raise some funding was probably one of the first 10 teams in Serbia to uh, raise offline it. Offline social network. Yeah. That's kind of an interesting term because isn't the whole idea of a social network to get connected? How do uh, you do that offline? Uh, yeah, so you will. Uh, so you have ways of doing it uh, offline uh, by not going through the internet but by using Bluetooth and actually choosing who you want to interact with. Ah. And uh, it, the main concept was uh, that it would use Bluetooth and not the internet connection and GPS. And the focus was on actually trying to amplify the experience uh, in uh, the physical world rather than just to push you in a virtual world. I know that there were some projects where they had like this dating app, so you uh, stored your preferences and as there was exchanging without knowing. And if there was a hit, then it said, hey, yeah, yeah, something yeah. I think it was happened and they, they were a competitor of ah, ours. Yeah. Okay, okay. But at some point, uh, Apple changed the way 
that uh, they broadcasted Bluetooth, so like the entire thing was uh, impossible to, yeah. to build. Uh, and then I went back to Serbia. Then uh, uh, a team from Facebook that uh, exited from Facebook and was trying to build the internet.org, but a more a commercialized version, uh, hired me. Uh, I was the third employee in Serbia and uh, then led the, the team in Serbia and the hired around 50 engineers. Uh, and then I started my first startup in Web3, uh, that was back in 2017-18. Uh, and uh, that was focused on smart contracts, building tooling around smart contracts. So tooling around smart contracts. Yes. So can, can you explain that a little bit? Because Yeah, so today if you want to build a website, you have so many tools that you're using to actually do that. You're really not going to create a HTML page by default. or so You just don't code uh, the HTML yourself. So you use tools to make that very easy for you. You use tools that generate like what you need uh, so that you don't actually need to like repeat yourself every time. Uh, but all those tools uh, are doing a lot of things automatically uh, where uh, there is no value from you. So for example, you want to create a React app. In order for an app to be uh, a React app, it needs a lot of uh, logic that uh, is always the same. And uh, then you have tools that actually generate that and then you're able to develop uh, your website. But then uh, as well, you have like debuggers, you have like monitoring. So like if a web page fails uh, on uh, a particular uh, client, which is the user that is using your, your website, you, you need to get alerted that that happened so mm -hmm. that you can actually fix that bug. That's a tool and those are super important uh, in order for a particular uh, paradigm of programming to exist. Now, smart contracts were a new paradigm. Like uh, we never had like such a paradigm before. So like it was a completely different way of programming things. You're not programming anymore the back end or the front end or uh, doing stuff on the infra. Rather, you're programming how the state of a blockchain is being updated. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, completely uh, new. And we, we uh, thought that uh, uh, there, there is a lot of space for us to improve the experience that developers had and also try to increase the security of those smart contracts. Because back then, if you wanted to deploy a smart contract, the only thing you could see was whether your smart contract failed or, or not. And uh, you couldn't really understand what was happening inside the smart contract. And uh, those smart contracts were meant to transfer millions of dollars of value without the developers really knowing what was happening. So that didn't make sense to us. So uh, what I thought is that we should create a, a monitoring tool and from the monitoring tool, we also expanded to alerting, debugging, uh, and also analytics, then like simulating uh, transactions before you, you actually like push them on chain and a bunch of other development tools. Yeah, there, there were a lot of these problems actually uh, when we had the ICOs where they, the, the smart contracts were, they had overflows, they had like uh, the, the value were not, like, yeah. it, it, there were a lot of challenges, but with tools, can standardize that and make it very simple actually uh, to to yep. issue such smart contracts. Okay, and uh, that, so the, that that was before you, you started before Cardano. Uh, before Cardano, and then you moved to Cardano. Yeah, then I was hired by Cardano, and uh, uh, initially I was doing uh, just helping a bit on the technical side. I didn't want to like focus on that uh, uh, too much because uh, uh, I just left my startup. Was uh, a bit tired of like generally working, so I was more like. <laughs> Trying to help, but really not uh, not trying to get much ownership. But uh, yeah, after 15 days, uh, someone su su suggested that they pitch the idea I had to Charles. Mm -hmm. They coordinated a call with Charles, and Charles liked the idea and uh, gave me, I don't know, 300, 400k to, to actually do it. And uh, yeah, I, I built a, a product that was meant for uh, bridging Ethereum and Cardano. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was that I I didn't think that smart contracts would uh, be useful without having some value to manipulate because mm -hmm. smart contracts on Ethereum were there from the start. So you had time for value to be created on the Ethereum network. So you had many tokens that had value. While on Cardano, we had no tokens. So no value could have been created there. So like mm -hmm. the smart contracts would really not be that beneficial because they would not have like uh, any utility. So I, I thought that the best way for bringing a value to the Cardano network was to actually mirror that value from the Ethereum network. And that was through creating a bridge. Okay. And then after the project, I was given native tokens as well. And then eventually smart contracts, then uh, side chains. And, and I've been there for a year and something and uh, then decided to focus more on storage. 
uh, because I was kind of tired from smart contracts. That was like already four years of doing smart contracts. Okay. Uh, and then I started focusing more on the central storage. And, and your average day today is 80% sleep and 20% work? Or because you said you wanted to do a little bit less? Or is that different? You're back in full force again? No, and... I'm back in full force. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I hope that the founders don't listen to that talk. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> cause problems. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, uh, even then, like, uh, it was probably, uh, like, in semi fast like, for 15 days, and then I yeah. eventually had to, like, uh, yeah. own the product and the roadmap and everything. Are you a person which gets bored easily? Like, can you really, like, completely relax for an extensive time and doing nothing? I mean, I, I'm not such a person. I, I get bored so, fa bored so fast. It's actually, I'm, I'm horrible after, after a week or uh, two, like two weeks for me, holidays is already, no, I have to do something. It's yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm at the stage where I need to, to relax. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, like, uh, I compromise the performance in the longer term. So I eventually learned how, how to relax, but, uh, yeah, but generally I get a week or two, but, or, or can you like no, relax no, for a month? No, five days, like, but yeah. try to yeah, But be. that's what I said. Like I say, yeah, I go. So for example, after the token summit, I, uh, I went off for eight days, but I, like I was completely relaxed after the third. I, I love scuba diving. So for me with scuba diving, I, I'm really relaxed. But then after six or seven days, I sometimes think now I have to do something, right? It's yeah. I mean, like, uh, yeah, that's what, why we live, I guess, like to mm. solve problems and mm. yeah, try to create some value. Yeah. So one question uh, which I'm really interested in as well, I heard a lot of stories about uh, the ecosystem in Serbia, a lot of developers there, you or briefly or not, you, you, you talked about mining out of Serbia and how that developed. Um, what's your, if you want to describe this, uh, the ecosystem there, well, how would you do that? Yeah, so I will start with, uh, it's very chaotic, but uh, <laughs> because of that, you have many hidden gems, mm -hmm. but it's super hard to find those hidden gems. And when I say hidden gems, like, I mean, uh, everything, like you have like pretty good uh, incentives for startups. You have on the other hand, like some incredible engineers, but there are very few that are incredible mm -hmm. and the majority is mediocre. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, because of those very few that were so good, uh, Serbia attracted a lot of companies uh, externally that uh, opened up offices there because uh, some engineers were great in the beginning, mm -hmm. but then like now still the majority is, is good, uh, but it's good uh, to, to the same level that France or Germany are good. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, because Serbia is such a small market, and there is so much competition for, for talent. We're now in a situation where like uh, hiring an engineer in Serbia is more expensive than actually hiring the same engineer in Germany. Okay. But, That's interesting. Uh, so it's, it's, it's more expensive to hire an engineer in, Germany, uh, in, in Serbia than in Germany? Yes. Yes. Right okay. now that's the case and it's kind of crazy, but yeah. uh, uh, that's what happens with uh, supply and demand, uh, especially when the market is so small and uh, so immature. But that also shows that if you embrace technology, uh, you attract talent, you attract the big players, which will have a positive impact yeah, yeah, on the economy. Course. Yeah, yeah, of course. It has like incredible impact on the economy. Uh, but again, uh, all of those need to also be nicely balanced. For example, now uh, what Serbia is seeing is a, a big influx of uh, people coming from Russia. Like mm -hmm. uh, everyone who is leftist and doesn't mm -hmm. uh, agree on the current uh, geopolitical situation, uh, has only one option, which mm. is Serbia, because like that's the only country that has not sanctioned Russia and mm. Europe. Mm. So now you have like that big opportunity for Serbian GDP to go up, but that also needs to be controlled because right now like uh, real estate prices are to the roof, uh, to the point where uh, it's on the same level as uh, uh, probably uh, California. So local people cannot afford living anymore. So what's going to happen next year is that who was living there for, for, for a, a long period of time won't be able to live in Belgrade anymore, mm. which is something that uh, the government really needs to uh, keep attention mm. on and balance that out with uh, the benefits that we get from, uh, from the, the big influx of people. Mm. And similarly for tech, like even for tech, like uh, uh, probably the government uh, needs to do some work to, to actually like uh, make sure that we capture better the value that is being created there from external companies. So if products are built in, in Serbia, 
uh, that's that's great because that's value that is generated in Serbia and at some point is going to be captured uh, in Serbia. But if someone is just using the talent and actually capturing the value and uh, exploring that, that should be like uh, looked uh, a bit differently. And uh, I need to say that uh, the Serbian government is doing some progress in terms of that because uh, there are some very good incentives if you're doing R&D, if you're doing mm-hmm. startups, uh, you're probably going to pay much less taxes uh, for some time mm-hmm. uh, before you actually get to a stage where you're as well like a large organization that can pay more taxes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the, they, they incentivize. Yeah, the, the, the yeah but this is pretty <clears throat> young and you like yeah. we need some time to see yeah. how that is going to play out. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and yeah, like uh, I'm pretty optimistic. If a friend uh, of yours would ask um, you and say, "Look, like, which, where should I educate myself?" I heard about Bitcoin. I heard about blockchain. I heard about cryptocurrencies. I heard about um, Filecoin. Uh, like, what would you tell them? Where to start? What What's a good starting point yeah. to get educated? First, uh, I think now it's the perfect period for uh, educating uh, uh, everyone because uh, we are in a bear market, so there is a lot less noise. Uh, and generally, like people I'll, have time again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, both time, but also like there is no noise. Uh, mm. I actually learned most of uh, the things I know during bear market mm. uh, because then and, 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 and that's actually something you said you because you started in 2013. So you said you learned uh, a lot during bear markets. So this is not something new. This happens every yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> cycle, right? Yeah, <laughs> actually, I feel m- much more excited now mm. uh, because. Uh, during the bull market, I couldn't even hire people, mm. and I had to comp- compromise on the, the quality of the people I was mm. hiring. And generally, if you're doing deep tech, that's like a, that's yeah. a super big risk for you to actually like compromise on on the quality of people. But back then, you couldn't really hire anyone because everyone yeah. was being bombarded by offers from yeah. uh, er- everywhere. Like even Web two companies, Google, uh, Microsoft, yeah. Apple, they were like all at the, their highest value valuations ever. Yeah. At the same time, you had crypto that did 20, 30 x in the mm. past uh, uh, 12 months. Everyone with yeah. crazy budgets, and, uh, yeah, and how can PHP you hire someone? Every PHP coder, which uh, sometimes ever heard of of smart contracts, was now a, a blockchain developer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is super risky, right? You yeah. can lose a hundred million of dollars in value mm. through those smart contracts mm. because you you hired someone that is not really yeah. ideal for that role. Yeah. Uh, well, in the bear market, it's uh, much much better because like only the projects that were uh, set up in a way uh, to focus on the longer term value that they are providing mm. uh, can survive, and everyone else who was like just hiring uh, just for the sake of hiring or for the sake of raising the next round is uh, yeah pretty much uh, not in a bad spot right now, mm. and uh, yeah probably is gonna die before the end of the winter. And now, what would you tell them? Or him yeah. or her. So, so uh, where I learned a lot was uh, uh, Andreessen Horowitz's uh, uh, blog posts and also the school that uh, they have. Like, uh, Actually, the school was something that uh, they pushed out uh, much later, but uh, mm-hmm. I think that's a great uh, initiative. So we try to provide the link. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because they give you like uh, that business perspective where you can actually see like why blockchain generally makes sense. Because people think this is something temporary that, sure, <laughs> is here uh, for the bull market and then everyone forgets about it. But actually, like, uh, there I, are... I totally, I mean, uh, that's what I tell everybody. Sorry to interrupt, but that's what I tell everybody. Now, uh, I think, even now we have another case, but now uh, the European Commission uh, and the European Parliament worked on a specific regulation which is going to be enforced hopefully soon in Europe. I think we went over that, uh, and I think this um, oh, this changed a little bit uh, already. That people think, no, this is really here to stay. It's not going away that fast anymore. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely uh, mm-hmm. believe in that. On the other hand, like uh, maybe to uh, to also go back on how I started actually mm-hmm. doing uh, Web three, and uh, back then it was blockchain. It was not even crypto. Uh, was because I was comparing like all the different verticals that I could focus on. It was uh, machine learning, it was blockchain, a few others like I don't know quantum computing seemed uh, interesting back then as well. Uh, IoT also seemed interesting, but all of those didn't make too much sense. 
uh, because I would be competing with all the big tech companies and most likely they would either try to acquire me at some point and I probably should uh, s sell to them because uh, you have no other mm. way to compete with them. Uh, and then you had blockchain. And blockchain, because of the regulatory uncertainty, was something that they could not touch, nor uh, they want to touch, because yeah. that is cannibalizing their business models, where they are capturing value uh, in a different way, uh, in their opinion, in a more efficient way. Uh, but uh, they, they are ignoring the fact that if it's an open network, if you have a blockchain behind that, it can be a much larger network. Mm -hmm. uh, so even though you're taking like uh, a smaller uh, value capture, uh, you can still create more value and because of that like total revenues uh, are much higher and also it's hard for them to understand how to create ecosystems because now you're not creating a for-profit company rather you're creating an ecosystem that is uh, self-governed and from there you can uh, create like many organizations supporting that ecosystem not only uh, one big organization trying to capture value on on everything so Blockchain was ideal uh, because so many opportunities are really not uh, uh, being tackled by any large organization and it's also difficult to follow because you need to have a lot of context, you need to understand uh, the entire like philosophy of the space, you need to really uh, like... Being willing to constantly educate yourself, to learn every day. It's like, I, I sometimes say it's like jumping on a train, which is already moving and always increasing the speed that's never going to stop anymore. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of journey you are, you are uh, putting yourself into if you start in that area. Yeah. Yeah. And generally how I was looking at it, it's not the train, but it's more a wave. And uh, you, you are kind of on a wave and you're going up. And whenever you have like a larger wave, uh, which is, for example, the bull market is just going to elevate everything. Mm -hmm. And you want to be on that wave because otherwise, like, you're not going to get any yeah. value, nor uh, you're going to be able to capture the value. Because when the big wave actually catches up the smaller wave on which you are, uh, you're going to have, like, a possible value that you can create, uh, but then you need to capture a part of that value. Yeah. And it's on you to figure out how to best capture that either through building a company uh, or being part of a larger team where you have some tokens in that particular uh, ecosystem, or it's just because you know something, maybe you know smart contracts, mm -hmm. so you're able to capture value uh, during that wave. But generally, I, I don't f think uh, it's a great value capture when you're just providing some value in a particular point in time and just capturing that moment because the bull market and the big wave is not going to be there forever. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you have actually uh, something uh, with which you can actually like be very tight on that wave. So uh, you actually elevate yourself a lot. Mm -hmm. So generally, I was thinking more from that perspective. It's also a nice uh, way of putting it, actually. Huh? Yeah. And uh, the value capture actually happens uh, mostly in the bull market, mm -hmm. but you need time to actually build whatever yeah. your uh, your uh, vision is uh, during the bear market mm. uh, and uh, building something in the bull market super hard super difficult most likely you're gonna make a lot of bad decisions because everyone is in a hurry yeah. you're being pushed a lot uh, you feel that money is infinite which is usually not and uh, whatever ecosystem you are in even crypto crazy uh, as much as you want but still money is finite and it should be finite. If it's not finite, then we are doing something wrong. Like <laughs> Absolutely true. We, we are also a little bit uh, running out of time. So um, my final question to all of our guests is actually, uh, what is your favorite coffee? And when we pre-discussed today's talk, uh, you already showed me a picture of your office with uh, four cold drip stations. So what is your favorite coffee? It might not be cold drip, but is it? Yeah, definitely cold drip. Uh, I, I think cold drip is uh, really underestimated, uh, like uh, the value that it provides. And uh, generally, like uh, it has everything. It has like uh, the full spectrum of flavors. It's not as acidic as, yeah, uh, as espresso, espresso yeah. or, or even worse, uh, filter coffee is even more acidic. Yeah, and well, like the, 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 the coffee cream they have there, uh, you have the, um, in, uh, there's a specific as acidic, Tea, which it comes like after 25 uh, seconds and that's the espresso time and then actually this 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 amount like the, the big amount of acidity is extracted after that 
So then you see like these white dots, which I cannot like drink. It's too yeah. acidic and it's not nice from a, a taste perspective as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but at the end, you have all the nutrients of the coffee, so yeah. which is uh, something that you should definitely try to yeah. uh, optimize for. And, and, and I told you that I will ask, I will invite myself <laughs> to your to the Belgrade office if I am invited. Yes, <laughs> you, you, you should definitely come <laughs> to to try your cold trip. Thank you very much, book, for your time. Thank you. uh, thanks for all the insights uh, you provided us. It was really very interesting, and um, yeah, hope to see you around here in Liechtenstein. Thanks.